He was born in Bethlehem. Shepherds declared that angels announced his birth. Now that caused a stir. When men came asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and have come to worship him. Herod was filled with wrath. The babe is now a man, teaching a new doctrine with compassion and authority. The people are following him. The chief priests and elders are outraged. There's a mob outside of Pilate's Hall today. Something's happening. Something's happening in Pilate's Hall. On the porch, Pilate pleads with an angry mob in this man called Jesus. I can find no fall. Something's happening in Pilate's Hall. I watched as his beaten, disfigured body fell beneath the load of the cross. His mother ran to him. Soldiers pushed her away. I heard the hammer fall, and I knew the nails had been driven, and he was on the cross. The scoffers kept chanting. I heard him speak words of forgiveness. There was darkness over the earth and a great earthquake. Then I heard him cry from the cross, it is finished. We watched him die, but somewhere deep within my being, I knew this was not over.
Revelation 5, we read, Worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and honor and strength and blessing. He is the risen Lamb, and he is our Christ. Let's sing to him this morning. Good morning, church, and happy Easter. We have two of our high school students here to get baptized this morning. This is Peyton Grosset, and she's going to start us off by sharing her testimony. Growing up, I knew about God, but it wasn't the center of my attention. I always made good choices and did what I was told to do. There was no big event that led me to God. It happened over time in high school. Attending Christian high school, I became friends with people who strive to grow in their faith. I went to Hume Lake the summer after my freshman year. I all of a sudden started to pay more attention to God and how he is everywhere. At Hume, they encourage you to take what you have learned down the mountain. I started doing that by attending church every Sunday and Wednesday and reading my Bible every day. Since then, I do things with one question in my mind. Will it glorify God? It's pretty plain and simple how God has changed my life. I have been happier and at peace knowing there's no need to worry about anything. I am getting baptized in, in order to declare to the world in obedience to the Lord's commands that I am a Christian.
Peyton, based on the testimony of your faith in Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next to go ahead and share his testimony is Diego Davies. I have been surrounded by my Lord Jesus Christ for my whole life, and I'm forever thankful for growing up and being surrounded by his love since I can remember. When I attended Summer Blast for the first time almost 14 years ago, I was introduced to the gospel message that then stuck with me for my whole life. Then growing up, I rededicated my life to him through Forest Home Summer Camp in middle school and again at Hume Lake in last summer. There have been so many people that have encouraged me to follow him and grow in my relationship, especially as of late, and I thank God so, so much for each and every single one of them. A verse that God has put, a verse that God has put on my heart recently is John 16, 33, which says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I knew baptism was my next step for a long while, but today I finally want to declare to the world in obedience to the Lord's command that I am a Christian. Diego, based on the testimony of your faith in Jesus, I ba baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
stand and sing this with us? Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God.
shall always be my song of praise. And for me was grace that born my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. Let's do this. He is risen. One more time. He is risen. Doesn't get much better than this. You may be seated. Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you for being in the fourth service. I'm glad to be in the fourth service. And uh, I, I feel very strong. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we always have a lot of first-time guests on Easter, and we want to do something very special today for all of you. Uh, uh, as you leave today, there's a table out on the main street there just for our first-time guests, and they will give you a, a complimentary book that we'd like to share with you. The book is called Shelter in God. It's a really encouraging book. And uh, with the book, you can get uh, vouchers for you and your family to eat on us at the cafe behind us uh, at the Generations Building. This has become a little tradition we have, and it's our way of saying thank you for coming. And we want to bless you, and we hope you'll come back, and maybe you'll meet somebody over there that'll be a lifetime friend. It's very special to do, and we thank you for letting us do it. While we're meeting in here, our kids are over in the Generations Building, and they're having a lot of fun. There's just a few pictures of what's going on over there. In every one of our four services, we have delivered 10,000 eggs to these kids. Now, just a word of advice to the parents. Somebody told me they're all full of chocolate, just so you know, going forward for the week. Um, and every, every week during this hour, during the 1045 service, we have this big uh, called... Uh, kids blast and these kids come and they love it and it's exploded over the last couple of years and all of you parents who come and bring your kids thank you so much 
they're having such a great time and they're learning so much about the Lord. Uh, we, we'll always be grateful for this opportunity we've had with this building and with all of these people. There are so many things going on here, but I hate to take Easter for anything other than just to talk about Easter. In fact, in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we have his firsthand account of what took place on that first Easter Sunday. Sometimes we just need to go back to the original and remember what Easter is all about. Here's what he wrote. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone had been rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, these two men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. <laughs> but Peter, he arose, and he ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Several years ago, Newsweek magazine carried an article on the subject of the resurrection. Always interesting to see what the secular people say about the things we believe. The article began with a reference to the scripture which we just read, and this is what Newsweek said about it. As the Gospels tell it, the women and the men who stared at Jesus' empty tomb were not inclined to believe the good news. Frightened and scattered, fearful that they had been misled, the apostles themselves were slow to accept the idea of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And yet, just as Easter is the holiest day in the Christian year, so is the resurrection the deepest wellspring of Christian faith and hope. For if God can raise Jesus to everlasting life, mankind can also expect to dwell with him in heaven. That's not bad for a secular newspaper. <laughs> Kenneth Woodward, who wrote that article, put the importance of Easter in perspective when he said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only hope we have of a future after death. Christ himself wrapped the two events in one sentence when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that sets our faith apart from all religions. What we celebrate at Easter is totally unique to Christianity. Let me be very clear about that. Men and women, the foundation of our faith is not the teaching of Jesus or the ideology that may have developed from it. The foundation of our faith is not the Christian worldview, as important as that is. The foundation of our faith is not the wonderful life of Jesus with his compassionate miracles. The foundation of our faith is not even the death of Jesus Christ. All the religious leaders of the world have died. In that respect, Jesus Christ would be no different. No, the foundation of our faith is the well-established record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ said that he would die and that in three days he would come back from the grave. He did exactly what he said he would do, and it was that event that exploded into the hearts of the disciples and convinced them that this Jesus was he who he had claimed to be the only begotten Son of God. John S. Wales said, the Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospel. <laughs> Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. 
I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, in a good church. My father was a pastor. He was a good teacher and many good Sunday school teachers. I always believed in the resurrection and knew it was important, but I didn't know it was the important thing in the faith. In fact, I was a second-year student in seminary before I figured that out. It happened like this. Donna and I were invited to a special banquet that was being held. They, they were doing these all over Dallas-Fort Worth where we were students. They were called uh, friendship banquets, and all of the students and seminary family were told to invite their friends to these banquets, and one of the professors from the seminary or one of the teachers would come and speak at this banquet and share the gospel. We were invited to this event, and our teacher was Haddon Robinson, the head of the theology department uh, of preaching. And I went to that event expecting to hear a rip-roaring sermon on the cross of Jesus Christ and his death and how you could be saved through the death of Christ. To my surprise, he spent the whole night talking about the resurrection. He mentioned the death of Christ because you have to do that if you're going to talk about him being raised. And for the first time in my life, I realized the resurrection is at the core of everything that Christians claim to believe. In this Easter message, I want to show you why that is true, and I want to help you get to where I got after that banquet and how it's so much been a blessing in my life. The first thing I want you to understand is that the resurrection matters to Christ. Let's start by putting the focus on the Savior, who's the star of this show. The resurrection matters to Christ, and it matters to him for at least three reasons. First of all, the resurrection vindicates Christ's word. Do you remember what we read a few moments ago, what the angel said to the women at the tomb? They said, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He, he's not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. The women, we are told, remembered Jesus' words. They recalled that Jesus had promised that he would die and that he would be raised three days later. During his ministry, Jesus often predicted his death and his resurrection. That's really important because periodically you will meet somebody who's a critic of the resurrection, and they will say something like this. Even Jesus didn't, didn't believe in the resurrection. Jesus never said he was going to be raised. If anybody ever says that to you, you can know one thing about them. They don't read the Bible. Because three times, even in the book of Matthew, Jesus told his followers about the resurrection. In the 16th chapter, in verse 21, we read that from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. A little later in Matthew 17, we read, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed unto the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And on the way to the cross, Jesus told his disciples, Behold, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify, and the third day he will rise again. So you say, well, why do you make such a big deal out of this? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because if Jesus promised something that he didn't produce, he's not worthy of anybody's faith. The resurrection is at the very core of the validity and credibility of the gospel. In his book on the resurrection, Stephen Mathewson drives this point home for us in our everyday life. He said, remember that Jesus has risen just as he said, when you wonder if he's really with you as he promised. <laughs> Remember that Jesus has risen just as he said when you doubt his promise that he will take care of your needs for food and clothing if you seek first his kingdom. Remember that Jesus has risen just as he said 
when you wonder if he's coming back with power and glory. Because Jesus rose from the death just as he said, you can believe what Jesus says. You can know that when he said it, you can trust it and it will happen. So the resurrection vindicates Christ's word. And it validates his work. Let me ask you this question. Suppose Jesus had said, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to rise again the third day, and then he died and nobody ever heard from him again. <laughs> Would his death on the cross be meaningful? Of course not. The resurrection is what proves the reality of the crucifixion. Someone put it this way. The cross is Christ's payment of our debt, the resurrection is God's receipt for the full amount. <laughs> so you see, the resurrection is important to Christ because it validates his work. In fact, throughout the scripture, you hardly ever see the crucifixion mentioned without the resurrection. That's an interesting discovery. When Paul was writing to the Roman believers in the eighth chapter, he said, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. I don't want you to forget that those two things go together. Christ died, furthermore, was risen. Do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is defined for us in a very succinct paragraph in 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to read it to you, and I want you to notice as I read this definition of the gospel that the resurrection is a part of the definition. Watch this. I declare to you the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can't have the gospel without all three parts. He died, he was buried, he rose again. There wouldn't be a good Friday without Easter because Christ would have long since been forgotten as just another martyr who died for what he believed. But Easter, my friends, is what validates the work of Christ. When he came out of that grave, he set himself apart from any other would-be spiritual leader. No one ever has claimed to do that. No one ever has done it. Thirdly, the resurrection not only vindicates Christ's word, validates his work, it verifies his worth. If the crucifixion had marked the end of the story of Jesus, he would undoubtedly still have been remembered as one of the greatest men to have ever walked on this earth. I mean, he was a captivating leader who amassed a devoted following. Those who loved him, like the woman who lovingly embalmed him, and Joseph who offered him his tomb, and Nicodemus who assisted in the process of embalming, countless others, they would have still been glad that they had been part in treating someone they loved with such devotion. But when Jesus Christ came back out of the grave, bringing with him power over death, he became more than a memory. Oh, yes. This event proved that he was indeed the Son of God. Paul said that in Romans 1. He said, Jesus Christ, our Lord, was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. How do we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because he came out of the grave victorious over death, miraculously proving his identity. If all, the, if all there was to Jesus was the cross, then he's just a martyr. But if the resurrection is true, then he is the Savior of the world. Speaking of saviors, Arnold Toynbee was perhaps the world's most read and most translated and discussed scholar of his time. His best-known work, A Study of History, was written from 1934 to 1961, and in that book, Toynbee has a whole chapter devoted to the world's saviors. And in this chapter, he says there are four different kinds of saviors in the world. First, there's the savior with the scepter. That's the political savior. Then there's the savior with the book, the philosopher, the teacher, the theologian, the educator. Next, there's the savior with the sword. 
the military leader, and finally there's the man-god or god-man-savior of Greek mythology. Toynbee points out that each of these savior types ultimately capitulate to the one great enemy, which is death. Politicians and kings and military leaders and philosophers have one thing in common. They all die. And then he concludes this chapter with these thrilling words. He says, when the last civilization shall have come to the river of death, there on the other side, filling the whole horizon with himself, will be Jesus Christ the Savior, for he alone has overcome the grave. He is our Savior. In the mind of the great historian, there is only one Savior who is qualified to save, for he has conquered death. So the resurrection matters to Christ. But do you know it also matters to the critics? It should not surprise you that if the resurrection of Christ is the cornerstone of the Christian faith, the critics of the Christian faith are coming after the resurrection. I cannot tell you how many books have been written over the years uh, attempting to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know one of the most astounding statistics about that is well over 50% of them are written by guys who in the process of doing the research became Christians. <laughs> These books which criticize the resurrection offer various explanations and theories. <clears throat> but I gotta tell you something, I've read most of them. It takes more faith to believe the theories than just to believe the truth. I'm not kidding you. Let me explain to you what I mean. Here's a couple of their ideas. The whole, the whole truth, the whole thing that, that's the deal here is they have to explain the empty tomb. They have to explain it. So one of, the, one of the explanations they concocted was what they call the wrong tomb theory. And here's how this works. According to this theory, the women who discovered that Jesus' body was missing had simply gone to the wrong tomb by mistake. But think about that. If that's true, all the Jewish leaders who were trying to disprove the resurrection would have had to do is go to the correct tomb and produce Jesus' body. But they didn't do that because it was, in fact, the correct tomb. It was just an empty correct tomb. <laughs> and here's my favorite one. This is called the swoon theory. Say that with me, the swoon theory. To swoon means to faint or lose consciousness. And this is what they came up with here. According to this theory, the disciples mistakenly believed Jesus was resurrected when he was really just resuscitated that he didn't die, but was only unconscious and was laid in the tomb. Now, consider what you have to believe in order to accept this theory. First of all, you have to believe that Jesus survived a six-hour crucifixion. Then you have to believe that he somehow managed to survive for three days in the coldness of a tomb. And then you have to believe that despite his weakened state, he was able to move a large boulder that blocked the entrance to his grave. And finally, you have to believe that he evaded the guards stationed at the tomb, convinced his disciples that he had a glorified body before disappearing into anonymity. I told you, it's a lot easier just to believe the real truth. He rose from the dead. There's one final that's kind of interesting to me because it's actually referenced in the Bible. When this whole thing happened, the, the soldiers who were supposed to be guarding Jesus' body were in deep trouble. They didn't know how to explain that Jesus wasn't where they thought he was. So they gathered together with their elders, and here's what Matthew tells us happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, the elders gave the soldiers a large sum of money and said to them, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Remember, they're trying to explain why the tomb is empty. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. In other words, they floated the rumor that the disciples came and stole Jesus out of the tomb to explain why the tomb was empty. This 
gives the disciples a whole lot more credit than they deserve. They weren't exactly the bravest bunch of men who ever walked on this earth. Do you remember that when Jesus was crucified, the Bible says all his, all his disciples forsook him and fled? During our Lord's trial, Peter denied three times that he even knew the Lord Jesus. After the crucifixion, the disciples hid themselves in an upper room and locked the doors. The same disciples were also skeptical when they first heard about the empty tomb, and one of the disciples said, I'm not going to believe it unless I can put my hands in the wounds of Jesus. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus doubted the reality of the risen Lord while they were at the same time talking to the risen Lord. But after Easter, all of Jesus' disciples were willing to die as martyrs for preaching about his resurrection. They didn't care what anybody said. They knew Jesus was risen. They knew this was the new message of the gospel. They went everywhere preaching. And if you study the sermons in the book of Acts, they are pregnant with the truth of the resurrection. Now, let me just tell you, it would be highly unlikely for them to sacrifice their lives for something they knew was a hoax if they had really stolen the bodies from the tomb, the body from the tomb, do you think they would have gone to their death on behalf of that rumor? So what happened? What happened was the resurrection. What happened was Jesus came out of the grave after three days victorious over death. And ladies and gentlemen, the resurrections for the, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First of all, it's an unusual event. And secondly, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. Finally, the resurrection matters to Christ and the critics, and it matters to Christians. I don't know if you've noticed, but we seem to have been witnessing a lot of death on our televisions of recent days. Massive funeral yesterday in New York shootings in just about every imaginable place. I don't remember ever being so conscious of that. Maybe it's just that we haven't had the ability to track it. But death is a very present subject for many, very depressing. The Bible says that some people live their whole life in bondage because of the fear of death. We don't want to admit it. We all share the same fate. The statistics on death are 100%. And they don't lie. It's the mature person who faces this reality head on. But here's the amazing thing. Those of us who have met the risen Christ, the one who conquered death itself, no longer have to fear death. Death is just a transition to the next life. Christians have a great perspective on death we don't want to die, and we'll fight to live with all our might, but when we have this hope of Jesus within us, we are not afraid to face death because we know what comes next. The resurrection of Christ offers us even something more than that, something unparalleled. Other religions may promise spiritual afterlife or bliss. They only offer solace for what has been lost. But the resurrection of Christ promises restoration. It's not just about getting your life back. It's about getting your life back, the life you always wanted but never experienced. Through Jesus Christ, you can have confidence that you will lack nothing in the future, that when he comes, it will all be right. Nothing will be left out. It's all coming in the future, and it's going to be unimaginably wonderful when you know him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is your future hope. I've been by the bedside of many Christians as they face their final moments. There's a distinct difference when you have the hope of the risen Christ in your heart. So the one thing that the resurrection does more than anything else for all of us is it punches our ticket for the future. It helps us to understand that God has a plan because he overcame death he has a plan for us to overcome death and live with him in eternity and not ever die spiritually. But you know what? The resurrection has a very present ministry to us as well. 
on our journey from here to heaven, the resurrection has a very important place to play in our lives. It's our hope. It's our reason for everyday life. I think I can explain that best by telling you a story. Most people are surprised after having listened to me for many years that I was an English major in college. But one of the things we did in college, we had to read a lot of the classics. I became acquainted with the writings of Hans Christian Andersen, and I loved his short stories. <clears throat> Here's one of my favorites. It was Sunday morning, and the sun was shining brightly, bringing warmth into the living room. Outside, under God's blue sky, where the meadow was green and fragrant with flowers, the birds were rejoicing. <clears throat> But while there was joy and happiness outside, inside there was sorrow and gloom. Even the wife, who usually was such a cheerful person, sat this morning at the breakfast table, and she looked down sadly. She got up without hardly touching her food. She dried her eyes and slowly headed for the door. It was as if a curse had come over this house, like a black cloud. I mean, it, there was an economic depression in the land. Industry was down. Everything in the country seemed to be going down, except, of course, for taxes. Taxes were going up more and more every day. The crops always seemed to be worse than the year before, and now there was nothing to look forward to but poverty and misery. And, of course, all of this lay heavy on the man of the house who was usually such a hard-working, upright citizen, but now he despaired at the very thought of the future. Whatever his cheerful wife said could not console him, neither could the secular or spiritual counselors or his friends made him even more silent and more depressed. It was no wonder that his poor wife was losing hope. When the husband saw his wife so unhappy that she was about to leave, he stopped her and he said to her, I will not let you go out of this house until you tell me what is wrong. She was quiet for a while and she sighed deeply and she said, last night I dreamt that God was dead and that all the angels followed him to his grave. How can you imagine such nonsense, said her husband. Don't you know that God could never die? Suddenly, the face of the dear wife was filled with happiness. She squeezed his hand and she said, you mean the good God is still alive? And she embraced him and looked at him with eyes shining with faith and peace and joy. And she said, since God is alive, why should we not believe in him and trust him? He who has not counted each hair on our heads, who will not let one single hair fall outside of his will, he who clothes the lilies of the field and gives the sparrows and the ravens their food. And as she spoke, it was as if the scales fell off of his eyes and the heavy bands around his heart were loosened, and for the first time in many days, he smiled. And he thanked his dear godly wife for the scheme she had come up with to rekindle his faith and give him back his trust in God. Do you see the story that hope is everything? And if we're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, even though we are Bible-carrying, church-going Christians, we can develop a lifestyle that lives as if the good God is dead. We go through difficulties and trials, and he's never a thought in our mind, never someone we go to when he's standing ready to be with us in every moment. The apostle Peter put it like this, he said, in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Peter said, you're going to have trials. You're going to have issues. You're going to have stuff. But in the midst of the stuff, there is Jesus. 
in the midst of the stuff, there's the risen Lord. He overcame death. Do you think he can handle your issues? He's the living Savior of the world. He is yours not only for heaven, he's yours for now. He's yours for every day. He's yours for tomorrow. He's yours for that issue this week. You didn't know what you were going to do with, but you've got to get involved with him. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, you have a hard time making that work in your life. And even if you are Christians, his disciples followed afar off. You, you can do the same thing if you're not careful. One of my favorite preachers of the last generation was Donald Gray Barnhouse, pastor of a great church in Philadelphia. In one of his books, he tells a story of Easter vacation one year when he was trying to win this young lady to Christ. She would come and talk to him, and he would tell her about the gospel, and she would say uh, she, she liked the gospel and she wanted to be a Christian, but she just couldn't believe. She couldn't believe. And he was trying to help her understand what it meant to believe. One day he said to her, how are you getting back to college? She said, well, I'm going back on an airplane. Have you got it, your ticket yet? No. I'm going down there tomorrow and talk with the people at the airline and get my ticket. Do you know the person at the ticket counter? No, I don't. And when you were going to get on that airplane, do you know the pilot? No, no, she said, I don't know the pilot. He said, so you're going to trust the word of someone you do not know to tell you where to go, and then you're going to trust someone you do not know and will probably never see to fly you where you're going, and yet you cannot trust one of the greatest and most attested facts in history of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't have any faith. You put your faith in something every day. But I want to tell you, the risen Christ is the greatest most proven fact in history. Some have written that there's more evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than that Abraham Lincoln ever lived. It's the most researched, discussed, examined truth that you will ever find. And over these years that have gone by in my lifetime, 50-some years of studying it, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ just gets stronger and stronger, and you can trust it. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will go to heaven. If you put your trust in him, you will live forever with the Father. If you reject it, you don't have that hope. And I want to ask you today, is there any reason why you would not want to be a Christian and believe and trust in the one who has conquered death for you. Let's pray together. Lord, the resurrection is so powerful. We feel its strength just bubbling up in our lives as we talk about it. I pray that today there will be some here who will say, I've played with this truth long enough. I've lived around it too many years, it's time for me to get to the center of it and put Jesus Christ in my heart. If you've never trusted Christ and you'd like to put your trust in him today, whether you're watching on television around the, the nation or on the internet, wherever you may be, or here in this room, I encourage you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just pray, dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, that he is the Son of God, that he came to this world and died on the cross and was buried and three days later came out of the grave victorious over death, and that if I put my trust in him, he will give me everlasting life. And so today in this service, in my heart, I pray to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart today and cleanse me and make me the person you created me to be. Forgive me for all of my sin and give me the gift of eternal life which you have promised to those who put their trust in you. I trust you today, Lord Jesus. I believe in you. I know 
that you are my Savior. And Father, thank you for those who have prayed with me. If you have prayed along the communication lines of television or the Internet, there's a place on the Internet screen where you can check that just says, I prayed with Dr. Jeremiah today to receive Christ. I hope you will do that. It will encourage us to know of your decision. And here in this auditorium, as we finish up our prayer in just a moment, as we still are here with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, if you prayed with me today to receive Jesus Christ, would you just let me know that by lifting up your hand and let me see it? Would you do it? Thank you so much. I see your hands. There are many hands here across the way. Thank you so much. Father, thank you that the invitation has been received by some today, and I know this is life-changing. I know this is a day never to be forgotten, a day that will change everything, and I give you praise. Thank you for these in this room, for those across the Internet who have prayed to receive you, and may you fill them with your presence is my prayer. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing two verses of Amazing Grace. But before we do that, I just want to tell you that if you prayed with us today, we have some information to give you, and we will do that if you will just after the service, come down here. And there's some staff people down here. They'll just give you a little packet. And this packet has information about prayer, about how to study the Bible, about how to get really walking in your walk with the Lord. It's absolutely free, and there's no, this is not a come on for you to do something else. We won't take you into the back room or anything. We just want to give you this information to help you grow. If you're interested in the church and becoming a member, you can talk to them about that. Or if you're a candidate for baptism, let them know. Let's stand together and sing this wonderful hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but before we go home. He is risen. He is risen. God bless you.